Okay, ready or all? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our eLotus webinar today. My name is Donna Chow, and I will be your host and your moderator for today's class. Today's webinar is Reversing Thyroid Disorders and Autoimmunity with the 345 Method of Healing with Reagan Archibald. Today's webinar is recorded and presented by Lotus Institute of Integrative Medicine. Here at eLotus, we have been hosting educational courses for over two decades, and we are proud to be your trusted source for premium CEU content with over 120 speakers, 600 courses, and 3,000 hours of continuing education. A bit of a housekeeping before we get started here. Today's webinar will run from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Pacific time. We'll have a one-hour lunch break from about 1 to 2 p.m. and two breaks in the morning and two in the afternoon. Reagan will let you know when those times are. The lecture notes are available for download and you can find them on the blue course access page and the chat room. Some of you are already using the chat room and are familiar with it. So for those of you who are is who are new to Zoom, you can use the chat room to connect with your colleagues who are also attending today's webinar live. Be sure to set the the setting to all panelists and all attendees, because when it's just set to all panelists, only the speaker, which is Reagan, Reagan or, or me as a moderator, only we will see it. And we want everyone to be part of the conversation. So be sure again, before you type into the chat room, you can even do it now. You'll see that it is automatically defaulted to all panelists. Go ahead and set it to all panelists and attendees. Okay, and if you guys have any questions, there's a Q&A button that you can click on and that will be seen directly by Reagan. And so during the class, if you guys have questions, he can answer them for you as well. The quiz for today's webinar will be available tomorrow afternoon and I will email you guys when that is ready. And the video replay for today's class as well as tomorrow will be available on Monday. And for that, I will also send an email out to you. All right, let's get started with today's class at, with Reagan Archibald. Reagan is a functional medicine provider and founder of the award-winning clinic East West Health, which has four clinics in the state of Utah that employs the best of both Eastern and Western trained doctors. He's also the founder of Go Wellness, which is the industry leader in creating a new genre in healthcare with research-based programs in acupuncture, functional medicine, and stem cell therapy. His mission is to end pain and chronic disease for as many people as possible and to educate and inspire individuals to enjoy the benefits of true health independence. So let's go ahead and welcome Reagan. And I'm going to stop my screen sharing here. And Reagan, you can begin yours and we can start the class. Okay. Hey, hey uh, nice to see you guys. And uh, Donna, it's so weird not being there and having Sam get me all mic'd up. I kind of missed the little massage that he'd give me. Um, so Sam, sorry, I'm not there with you uh, live, but, but really honored to be here today. And we've got a lot to cover this weekend. Uh, I know it's, you know, some of you are like, oh, Reagan, it's eight hours. What are you talking about? But, but yeah, try to, trying to condense this uh, topic into an eight hour uh, subject, uh, eight hour um, time frame is, is challenging to say the least. But uh, my goal for this, and especially this first hour here, is to reframe how we're thinking about health and wellness. And I want to thank each one of you who are here live. And uh, so let's, I just want to make sure you know how to use the chat box and want to get a little, little shout out to everyone. Awesome. We got Christy from Southampton, England. We've got Jennifer from New York City. Whoop. Uh, we got Darren from Santa Barbara. Uh, we've got uh, Katerina from Ojo Caliente, New Mexico. I was just in New Mexico, and uh, my I have a clinic in Albuquerque. Holy smokes. Uh, we've got Carolyn from Halifax, Nova Scotia. I've never been there, and I love to travel. That needs to get on my list. Uh, what's it like in Nova Scotia? Um, we've got Phil from San Diego. Uh, Jen's from Carson City, Nevada. Um, Jens, I, I, uh, lived in Fallon, Nevada. I finished high school there after, uh, my dad, uh, we were cattle ranchers in Idaho and, and, uh, he lost a big contract. And anyway, we moved to Fallon, Nevada. So we used to go to Carson city and play football and basketball games against you guys. Um, Petaluma, California, Jennifer, welcome Oakland, uh, Newport beach, love Newport beach. Was there not, not too long ago, Templeton, California. We got Joyce. Craig from San Francisco, um, 
And another one from San Diego, Tammy. Um, green Wave, that's right. I was the Green Wave, the big Gurkha. Very intimidating when we'd show up with our uh, Gurkha. Um, Gorman from Pennington, Lucine from Florida, Jolie from Denver, and Devin from Oregon. All right. Well, now what I want to ask each and every one of you is how many of you are treating thyroid disorders and autoimmune disorders in your practice? And um, I can tell you, this has been um, seven years that we've been treating it. Awesome. Gorman's doing it. Uh, Catherine, very few. Uh, yes, very few. Some, yes, some. Um, good. And uh, have your first Hashimoto's case. Oh, good. You're, you're in the right place. Yes, 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 yes. Some, very few, very few. Um, how many of you would love to have lots of iodine supplementation? Okay, Jen, let's talk about that as we get into treatment strategies later. Um, because, uh, yeah, there's some, there is some, as you know, there's some, some definitely some interesting opinions. There's some differing opinions on uh, you, the use of iodine in thyroid issues, especially if it's autoimmunity. But so this is great. So, um, so what if we looked and what if today I could give you a simple way of solving the thyroid issues where you, you didn't have to like feel like you're being stressed and you knew you could get a result every single time with every single patient. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. It's a three, four, five method of healing. It's a process that I've, I've fine tuned over the last 17 years. Um, hope is here. I know hope. Hey, good to see you. Hope Oakland, California. And, and uh, hope has, has actually been out to Utah to visit me in the clinic. So uh, really happy you're here. Um, but this, this thyroid condition is, um, these conditions are so prevalent in our society that we often miss it. And so many of your patients are going to go to their doctors and, uh, the doctor's going to say, everything's fine. You're just, it's all in your head or, you know, you've just got, uh, you know, maybe some blood sugar issues and they miss running the correct labs. So we're going to talk about that. And it looks like Carolyn, you're treating lots of fertility with underlying thyroid issues. Yes, absolutely. One of my uh, uh, coaches in Go Wellness, uh, Dan Kellams, who's also our creative director, is a fertility specialist. And he says at least 60% of his patients who have infertility issues, uh, he's also treating their thyroid. And welcome, Cynthia from San Francisco, or Cindy, excuse me. Um, okay, so, so as we go through this today, I'm going to ask you guys, you know, let's just check in real quick and let's just set some intention of, you know, I have this concept called never stop healing. And I'm going to share with you kind of what I've built out and talk to you a little bit about my story, but then I'm going to give you some real detailed tactics of how you can actually not just solve the, the problems of Hashimoto's and, and re reverse uh, these autoimmune diseases, but I'm also going to give you uh, an ability to actually read blood labs, uh, functional blood chemistry, and then show your patient why that is so important in their overall healing process. And so I'm going to show you how to put it into a business context tomorrow. And I will share with you all the information that we share with our signature Go Wellness clients. And this information, you'll have a choice. You can put it in on your own and really um, maximize it, or you do nothing with it. You just have a great learning experience and you get some PDAs, but whatever your choice is, let's set an intention right now. Let's do a few deep breaths. And I want you to set an intention for the weekend. And if you're joining me just for today, happy to have you here. If you're here tomorrow as well for our healthcare on purpose, and you really want to grow your, your business um, and learn that side of the, the medicine, then uh, set the intention for both days, but let's take three deep, deep breaths. So inhale through your nose, exhale slowly through your mouth, and inhale through your nose, and exhale. One more, inhale, and exhale. All right, let's get started. So, so I am also one thing um, that we've done this year is we have been working on anodyne pain and wellness. This is part of my team here. This is um, all but about 14 of my employees. And so, and, and uh, Cade, my brother, there's a partner, but what we've done is we've created a, a whole nationwide network called anodyne pain and wellness solutions. And so we are a dedicated group of individuals, but 
I can tell you, I would not have been here and not have created everything I've been able to create. I feel so blessed to have uh, so many great collaborative partners in my life and amazing team members, but I would not be here if I did not have Hashimoto's myself. And so the way I got into this medicine is I was at the University of Utah studying my pre-medicine and I started to notice that my hair was falling out. I started to put on weight. I was not sleeping. I felt really achy. And I said, man, this is no way for uh, someone in their early 20s to feel there must be something wrong. And so after I went to the fifth doctor who told me that my labs look great, I finally went to a naturopathic doctor. And it was the same naturopathic doctor that ran my labs. And he said, actually, Reagan, you've got Hashimoto's. You've got, you've got a problem with your thyroid, but it's your immune system that's the real threat. And we traced it back to my childhood of being exposed to chemicals on the farm. And so it was the work that that naturopathic doctor did. And then that naturopath sent me to an acupuncturist named Tao Tan, where I worked at two different medicines in helping my body solve these, these complex problems. And I'm happy to report that uh, after uh, I've, I went and, and have uh, had stem cell infusions, peptide therapy, I've been, I've had my thyroid in remission for over eight years now. So I've had no antibodies showing up uh, above about 10 on my, on my labs for Hashimoto. So, so this is something I feel it's near and dear to my heart. I love training other providers on it because what I've seen is people walk into our office with despair. They don't know where to find answers and they walk out with a whole new breadth of knowledge. And so I believe that this is now is the time where we really need to solve these complex chronic diseases. And so with Anodyne, we are now a nationwide network of clinics and, um, you know, there's territories all over. Um, we will have 30 by the end of the year and then we'll go uh, 50 um, by next year. And so it's a very fast growing organization that I'm happy to be a part of. I also founded Go Wellness, which is a, a platform where I can train other doctors and, and mentor them. Um, we've got over 120 active clients and I've coached over thousands of acupuncturists and, and uh, medical doctors and functional medicine practitioners. Our next session is May 14th and 15th, and I'd love to have you attend with us. So if that's of interest to you, then uh, you'll be able to get on, go to Go Wellness and you can find that out. We've got a, a team of Dan Kellum. Greg Eccles, Gene Healy, Dr. Mark Yandas, our medical director. And then we've got Annie and Ann who can help you out on the back end with any questions you've got throughout the course of this. And then you've got me, who's the founder, and my brother is the co-founder, Kate Archibald. So, um, so that's a little bit about me. So, so as, as I go through this, now that you kind of see my history and my past, I'm going to share with you some things that I've learned about thyroid disorders and Hashimoto's. And, you know, as we've taught this, the very first thing that I find is as you're going through and as you're learning, the very first thing that I'm going to, uh, you know, ask each and every one of you to do is to decide to be a better practitioner today. Like, let's not wait until tomorrow. Let's, let's act as if you are thyroid experts right now. So, so what I want you to do is get in a state, get in the state where imagine that you are in front of that patient and one of you has a, your first Hashimoto's case. And just imagine that you're able to get that patient, take them through an entire pro program, get the right labs ran, get the right treatments, give them the right teaching curriculum. So but by the time they're done with you and six to 12 months from now, they've got their health independence. And just imagine how good that will feel. Uh, so just decide that you are going to be the best practitioner that you could possibly be, and you're going to elevate your game today. So uh, Jim Rohn, he said, the first source of inspiration is deciding. The second source of inspiration is planning. So now that you've decided, we'll get that out of the way. And then, and then planning is what we're going to do today is getting your plan in place. So I'm going to show you how we do it. And then you can just duplicate what, what we do. And then the biggest source of inspiration is beginning. And so that's what's going to happen Monday for you as you're going to begin your process. And so as we talk about this, this healing and as we talk about treating Hashimoto's, you know, there's a big difference between a cure and healing. 
you know, if you are marketing that you can cure Hashimoto's and cure thyroid co- diseases, you're going to get in trouble with uh, your state boards or the FDA. And so what I look at is this is a process of healing. And healing is so much different than a cure because a cure just brings you back to your original state. What healing does is helps you go through a process of transformation. And the very book, the very first book I ever wrote is a book called Your Health Transformation. And I think many of you have read this book, uh, but it talks about that journey that a patient goes on and all the things that are necessary and all the steps needed to really solve these complex issues so that they can heal. And so healing, as you'll see in the three, four, five method, is a lot about removing the barriers because our bodies are factory, come factory installed, so to speak, with um, with these capabilities to heal. And our job as practitioners is to access that healing capability. And so never stop healing is, is this concept that you've got to have if you're going to work with these complex cases, because a lot of us, we start feeling defeat when we're, you know, treating them week after week after week, and there's no progress. Well, well, don't stop, but don't keep doing the same thing, hoping that this next, this, you know, this next set of acupuncture points is going to be the big one. You know, I've never actually seen that work um, with these chronic diseases. What you have to do is you have to go and take a step back and say, how can I look at other medical models out there and start applying those to my Chinese medical practice? And if you're too close minded and you say, look, Chinese medicine is everything, I believe it's the foundation and it's always been the rock bed of our, um, you know, over, let's see, we've, we've helped to almost 100,000 people now. Um, Chinese medicine is always the foundation, but but you've got to start looking at these other things that you can bring in. And, and we'll talk primarily about functional blood chemistry as being kind of a primary pillar of the core treatments and, and the core testing that you're doing. So, so you know, remember, healing is a process. It, it's a process of constant transformation. You never reach the pinnacle of health. And then once you're, you know, we don't have like a oh, it's Sunday on April the 18th, I became healthy. I was healed. And, you know, it's, it's like, no, that was, or I was cured. It was like, no, that was a healing transformation in a pivotal moment, but um, there's still another level of health. And so, uh, you know, I have a saying that uh, disease doesn't go on vacation and healing never stops. And so it's, uh, there's no shortcuts in this process. What I'm going to be sharing with you are the details that will get you to that, that healing transformation where it keeps occurring every day. And so there's a book uh, that, that I, I don't know if any of you have read. It's called The Slight Edge. And uh, Olson is the, the author. I can't remember his first name. But, um, but what he talks about is the fact that if you can get these small incremental improvements, you know, just 1% every day, then suddenly there's this, this boiling point that occurs where your body and your mind or whatever habit you're trying to develop, this is more of a book on habits, um, all of a sudden you start seeing all these transformations occur. But it's not something that's it's deceptive in the beginning because as you're starting to make changes, especially with your patients, you know, the first three months, the first, you know, zero to 90 days, yeah, it's going to be subtle changes. Now that we've had peptides in, we can get a change within the first 30 days, but it's still, we expect to have these big miraculous things to occur. Um, and we want it instantly, you know, we're in a society of instant gratification. And so what I've learned is that if you can lean into the small changes and just focus on this hundred day process where it's 1% per day for a hundred days, imagine the change that you're going to have, because this is like compounding interest. And uh, tomorrow I'll be sharing with you this, uh, this analogy. Um, would you take $10,000 every day for 30 days? Um, or would you take a penny and have that penny double in number every 30 days? And so um, that's going to be what I'll share with you tomorrow. But it's the same concept in these slight improvements in health where you get to the multiples where it's, you know, now my health is it was adding, but now it's multiplying. And so that's what we do in this program. That's the three, four, five method is all about making these small shifts that lead to big outcomes. 
And we've been doing these hacks, these health accelerator challenges. We'll talk a little bit about that today. But these hacks are what allow our patients every week I give them on Wednesdays from 4.30 to 5.30, I give them new um, habits, new things to put into their life, just small things. Right now, this week is add magnesium, vitamin D and vitamin C, because we're talking about regulating the heart and brain coherence and getting rid of that stress response. So, so those, you know, small things, but they make big results. So, um, so today, as we go through this, just remember the whole three, four, five method is built around this concept of small changes lead to big outcomes. Don't try to go like expect to have some massive change up front without some of the work, but also don't expect it to take long for your patients to already start feeling better. So, all right, so let's talk about the thyroid. We'll jump into some of the science. We'll get down to some fundamentals um, and then we'll jump right into the, uh, the whole method. So your thyroid hormones, remember what they do. You know, they impact your brain performance. They affect your mood. They influence your energy levels, your libido, all these things that you uh, probably know of, but I'm gonna, we'll just go through a quick refresher. Um, what the studies show is that up to 40% of the population suffers from some level of an underactive thyroid. So especially older women. And uh, this is disturbing because when you start to have a poor thyroid function, then that's where all the other hormones start to get downregulated. And this is where aging can occur very quickly. The thyroid hormone is one of our youth hormones, just like growth hormone is. Um, so is our thyroid hormone. And, and what the studies are showing now is that there's about a 60% drop in growth hormone by the age of 40. And then you couple that with a thyroid diminishing uh, depletion, then you've got a person who is not feeling at the top of their game. So um, how many of you have these symptoms? How many of you have ever experienced thyroid symptoms? Because these are some of the main ones that I hear every day. I'm fatigued and I'm in a brain fog. I'm frustrated. No one is concerned about my thyroid health. You know, I just go to my doctor and all the doctor looks at, well, your TSH looks good. We'll keep you on the same medication. How many of you are worried that your thyroid medications are always being changed? And this is one of the things that I see is that um, your thyroid is these medications aren't always going to be, um, you know, exactly dead on. And if you treat the thyroid with just medication alone, then you start managing the medication versus actually helping the thyroid. And so as you go through this, you got to realize that your thyroid is one of the most important glands in the body. It's got a very big job, but most people are getting the wrong types of testing. And so that's what we'll talk about this morning is how to get the right test. Because if you think of hypothyroidism, um, this is when you have too little of T3 and T4 in your system. And there's multiple reasons of why either your liver is not converting it, or maybe you've got uh, elevated levels of cortisol, uh, which turns off your reverse T3. And, and so we'll talk about these, but some of the symptoms you'll notice in your patients are they'll have trouble sleeping. And, and think of a patient you've met with recently and say, man, this sounds like, this sounds like Bill Smith or, or, or Sue Smith or whoever, but think it, tr trouble sleeping, tiredness and fatigue, difficulty concentrating, weight gain, dry skin and hair, depression, sensitivity to cold, frequent heavy periods, joint and muscle pain. Uh, these are all things. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I've been able to do with my, my thyroid condition is I, I got really comfortable um, with cold. And I actually, last May 20th was my birthday. And so I had a challenge to myself that um, I was going to take an ice bath every day for a year. And uh, I've missed a few in the winter. It just, uh, you know, I, you know, I was traveling or whatever, and I, but I'd always get a, at least a cold shower in. But the, the cold bath, this, this ice bath challenge that I've, I've put myself through has been incredible. I've got about another month and uh, then I don't see why I wouldn't continue it. But these, you know, and then I expose myself to extremely hot temperatures. But, but with your thyroid patients, 
they, they really want things to be very stable at about a 74 to 75 degree temperature. And, and uh, I can always tell when I've got a, uh, one of my team members who's got thyroid issues because I walk in the room, I'm like, oh man, you got the, they got the space heater next to them. It's about 80 degrees all the time. They've got coats on. So um, these are big things. Um, the thyroid is part of your overall endocrine system. It uses iodine to make the two main hormones and that's just T3 and T4. And these are the main hormones that allow your body to create energy. And so the T3 is the active version of the thyroid hormone. And T3 is the only, it's, it's sized right so it can actually fit on those receptor sites in the cells so the cell can take the thyroid hormone in and actually get the message and the communication that it's trying to administer. T4 is, is too large of a particle. So the body has to strip off one of the molecules and it primarily does that about 60% anyways in the liver. The other 20 to 30% is done in the digestive tract and then other parts of the body and some of the tissues. So, but if this T4 doesn't get converted, it's similar to putting that crude oil into your car. You know, you, you wouldn't want to, you know, just pull up and, and, uh, you know, hope that your car would, would take that crude oil and, and convert it into something, uh, useful for your car. It, it, we just know it wouldn't. And so that's, that's what a lot of our patients have when their TSH might look good. Their T4 looks good. T3 looks fine, but really there's this conversion issue and, and you just have these, these molecules circulating in the blood that have never really been broken down. And especially with the incidences of fatty liver disease and NASH, um, you know, NASH is, uh, it's, it's one of the most uh, dangerous conditions going on in the United States right now, more prevalent than diabetes, but it's, there's no drug for it. So you don't hear it on TV, but you'll see it in labs all the time. And I think many of you, if you're, if you're doing any functional medicine, you probably noticed that. Um, so here's the, the thyroid, you know, it helps with breathing, heart rate, central and peripheral nervous system function, body weight, muscle strength, menstrual cycles, uh, body temperature, cholesterol levels, metabolism. And this is where you'll start to see it. You know, if your thyroid gets out of balance, you'll start to see an elevation in HDL or elevation in LDL and your LDL HDL ratios will be off and you fix the thyroid and suddenly the cholesterol balances out. Um, so we'll talk more about that. Hyperthyroidism is when you have uh, too much T3 and T4. And this is where you have irritability, moodiness. You can have weight loss, nervousness, hyperactivity, sweating or sensitivity to high temperatures, hand trembling, hair loss, missed or light menstrual periods. And you'll find that, that with your thyroid patients, the pendulum can swing. Um, it can swing pretty dramatically just from one week to the next uh, as far as how they're feeling. And so this is where looking into the thyroid and really understanding how to analyze the labs is going to be the most important thing you can do because, you know, essentially there's two ways that you can look at this. And one is more the conventional medicine way where it's disease oriented. You know, yes, you've got hypothyroidism. Let's give you a prescription medication and send you on your way. And this is one of the approaches that's happened in the United States and Synthroid is, is a thyroid medication that's been around since the 1950s. I mean, T4 was just magical and all Synthroid is, is it's hundred percent T4. Um, but one of the problems with it is cornstarch is one of the fillers and the binders that keep the structure in the, in the hormone tablet. But um, that, that cornstarch is one of the foods that, your immune system can react against. So your patients who are on levothyroxine or Synthroid, you want to look out for uh, that medication because of the filler. Um, and so it can, it can really be detrimental to their overall health. Conventional medicine is very doctor centered where the doctor will diagnose you. The doctor will treat you. Everyone's treated the same. Once you have the diagnosis, here's the treatment. Um, it's very specialized. So as you've seen, your patients will go to <clears throat> their primary care doctor, their endocrinologist, they'll go to, uh, you know, then finally they'll go to, uh, uh you and you'll say, wow, well, this is going to be us working as, as a partnership. Um, but yeah, there's, there's too many specialties in medicine, which I think are very valuable, but off to, uh, far too often we fail to see the bigger picture. Um, conventional medicine is very diagnosed based on symptoms 
And yes, I do have conventional medicine in my practices. Um, I've got um, three different medical doctors who work for me and I love working with them because of their, um, you know, they, they do bring in a lot of strength on understanding how to diagnose certain diseases, um, which is great. But then they, they can take a step back and take more of a holistic perspective as we work as a team with our patients. Um, in conventional medicine, they're really into being early detective of disease, but far too often things have fallen apart before there's any action taken. In more of a functional medicine approach, it's more health oriented. So what can you do for yourself? It's similar to the um, John F. Kennedy quote is uh, not a, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. Um, you know, it's same in functional medicine, you know, ask not what your doctor can do for your health, but ask what you can do for your health. And so that's the most important. It becomes health centered. And we have a policy in our practice that we only work with people who put their health as their number one priority. And if you are competing against other interests, then you will not get these, these chronic patients any help. And so what I mean by that is if they have, um, you know, maybe their, their work is their, is their whole, um, that's, that's what their focus is, or maybe it's, it's, um, you know, a new project they're working on, or even being a mom or, or, a, or a dad, you know, those things are super important. But when the patient puts their health as their number one priority, then they're going to plan out their entire day. You're not going to have the excuses of, oh, Reagan, I just don't have enough time. I don't have enough time to live healthy. Um, I don't have enough time not to live healthy. I don't have enough time not to work out every day and not to be on my game. And I think you probably feel the same, but before you ever take a patient into your practice, you want to let them know what your philosophy is because the philosophy, your philosophy will help dictate the behaviors that they have in your program. And then as we know, and as um, like uh, Jonathan Katz uh, has spoken of, he's uh, you know, been a very, very uh, large critic of, of the way he's, he's at a Yale university, I believe. Um, but he says that uh, 95% of all chronic diseases are a hundred percent preventable, but we can only do that through lifestyle and disease um, you know, changes and transformation. So you got to change the lifestyle, but the behavior is what predicts the lifestyle. And so if you can get their, their health priority as number one, then you'll have um, so much better chance of, of really solving this problem. And remember, you have a lot of leverage as, as we go through the uh, report of findings, we'll do that uh, this evening. Um, you do not want to miss that section um, and be here live for that, because as you have questions, I want to make sure each and every one of you know the step-by-step -step process in the ROF. And I, I think it's today or tomorrow. Sorry, it's kind of blurred in my brain, but, but I do have it in there where we'll share what you want to do to create that leverage so that the person actually is, is reaching and they really want to know how they can heal. But to never stop healing, you've got to have a person put their, their health as their number one priority. We take it, it's patient-centered, it's holistic. We look at underlying disease causes. Um, we do look at biochemically, uh, you know, how are people functioning individually? And then um, it's a preventative approach. So it's not just like, hey, let's wait till the disease comes and prevent it from getting worse and we'll manage the disease. But it is actually looking upstream and I'll share with you an example um, right now, but, but before we go into the labs and I'll give you a, an overview of what functional medicine labs look like and how this has transformed our practice. And I'll, I'll tell you, um, you know, COVID was one of the best things that could have happened, um, to our practice. And I hope you feel the same. I know many of you who are just acupuncturists have gotten hit pretty hard in 2020, um, but I can tell you there's a whole new world out there with virtual medicine, which we'll be covering today and tomorrow that can change everything. And it changes your whole trajectory, your purpose. You can still help people, whether they're in your clinic or not. But, but I'm going to ask each one of you, you know, how do you, how do you know how well your thyroid is functioning? How many of you actually have had your blood labs ran recently? And, um, yeah, good. Oh, Jennifer is like, uh, um, I'm in virtual medicine right now, not doing any ACU uh, currently. Awesome. All right. 
Um, so yes, so it, it's a, it probably has made a huge difference for you, Jennifer. You can keep your confidence. Um, don't have to quit your, your job as an acupuncturist or shut down your business. I mean, it's, it's been um, pretty empowering for us. But, but how many of you have had your thyroid labs ran? And if not, how many of you would like to see how healthy your thyroid is in all the systems in your body? Okay, because we're going to jump in. I'm going to give you a quick overview of functional blood chemistry. And then uh, we'll take a quick break and then we'll come back and um, we will go through the how to understand functional blood chemistry. So I'm going to share with you, I'm going to give you enough knowledge to where you could actually run an Avexia panel, have it in front of you and be able to just with a little bit of research, interpret that and then share insights with your patients. So this will give you more information about blood chemistry in the next hour than I had in my entire three and a half year training in school, seven and a half, if you had it all together. I mean, never got this uh, detailed of training. So, okay. So let's, uh, let's, let's jump in. So number one, you got to look at the pathways, right? And so if you're looking at the correct pathways, then you can determine the cause and you can understand what course you need to take. And so if you look at the T4 to T3 conversion, your hypothalamus, it releases the thyroid releasing hormone. That's the TRH. And remember the hypothalamus is like the executive of, of your endocrine system. It just executes. It looks and visualizes and kind of plans based on the communication it gets from other hormones in your body. And then it sends the message to the pituitary. So it's no different than a business organization where, you know, I'm the CEO of, of um, our organization. And so I do a lot of planning, a lot of visualization. I, I reach out to other innovators. And then once the plan is ready and I feel confident and solved on it, then it goes to the management team and the chief operations officer, which is Cade, my brother, and to Kylie. And they execute and get the plan laid out and then it gets orchestrated downstream from there. And so, so the pituitary causes, it, it creates the thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH. And then the TSH goes to the thyroid and the thyroid, it says, Hey, we need more thyroid production. So if a TSH is high, that means the, that the, the executive and the manager are telling the thyroid, Hey, you're underperforming. We need to, you need to create some more juice. You got to be more productive. And so when you get these, these scores of like anywhere from four and above, you need to be alarmed because that's where the brain is telling the thyroid, Hey, we do not, the body is, is struggling. Uh, this operation is, is starting to suffer because you're not producing enough thyroid hormone. So the thyroid gets put into gear and then it creates T3. And some of that T3 goes to reverse T3, which is an inactive form. And it's just waiting for the, the body to use it. And then the T4, some of it gets converted to T3 in the liver. Like I said, about 60, uh, 60%. So the thyroid makes about 93% of what it makes is T4. And the other 7% is T3. And then it gets converted in, in the liver and in the gut. And so as we cover the labs, then what we want to look at is, is we want to step, take a step back and say, well, okay, well, how is the body relating to all this? And how do I know if I have a thyroid that's underperforming? And so in your, in your whole functional blood chemistry analysis, and as you're going into uncovering the pathways, you know, we'll talk a little bit about digestive system and about some of the, the uh, genetics and, and uh, adrenal hormones. But the very first thing you want to run is a functional blood chemistry panel. And so you can see here in this particular patient who complained of cold hands, cold feet, no libido. Uh, she was on medication, but just didn't feel any better on the medication. And she said, man, what do I do? What? I, I need some answers. Um, and so when we ran her labs, you know, I, I told her up front, I said, when we run your labs, it's going to be different than the labs your endocrinologist runs. And so what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at the above optimal range and below optimal. So this is what we consider the functional ranges. So uh, the current lab values in our country are based on uh, just averages. So 90% of the population, if they fit into these averages, they're considered healthy. This is one of the things that we've seen historically is men's testosterone levels drop every year they get lower and lower on average 
And so guess what we do at the labs? Well, we just say, well, I guess men don't need that much hormone and testosterone. So let's just lessen the lab. Uh, let's just lessen the ranges and the parameters um, in functional medicine. We just think that's absolutely um, ridiculous because um, if you're just taking it on averages, you look around and we're in a society uh, where more people have chronic diseases than there are more than there are healthy people. So it's not a wise way of looking at it. So, so as you're looking at the functional medicine approach, you want to make sure you've got that right parameter in your mind. And so you can see the yellow. This is the above and below average. You see the red. This is the above and below standard range. And these are the disease ranges. And these, these are pretty typical that would, this is where your doctor might say, you know, that's a little high or a little low. We're going to watch it. And then there's the alarm high and the alarm low. And this is where medical inter intervention is usually like right away. It's immediate. Um, so let's, let's go through that. So this patient and, you know, our goal is you want to have fewer than 10 positive findings in any lab. Anytime it becomes over 20, you know, that's, it usually takes about a year to solve each 10 of those items it takes a year to get everything perfectly balanced. And there's, uh, obviously there's other, you know, there's that, that's just a generalized statement. But um, that's what we found. So I like to work with patients for three years who have autoimmunity because then I know we can really correct the problem for good. Um, so here's, here's what we found. We found, first of all, you can see in the above average and below, um, she's got 23 positive findings. There's eight in the standard range. So that gets her to 31. And then there's four in the alarm. So that's 35 positive findings. And this patient was struggling. And so you can see she's got her glucose. This is a fasting blood test. Her glucose is fine, um, her heme, but her hemoglobin A1C is low. And as we talk to her, she does get signs of hypoglycemia. You know, she gets some shakiness and she gets uh, her brain fog accelerates. And, and so, um, yeah, we said, okay, there's probably some hypoglycemia. We found that her liver and kidneys could be functioning better with her Boone and creatinine ratio being elevated and her kidneys aren't dispelling waste properly. You look at her GFR at 72 or excuse me, 62. Um, and, and this GFR is, you know, your glomerular filtration rate. Um, she was incredibly dehydrated. And part of the reason she was dehydrated is because her adrenal glands, her cortisol was so elevated that the adrenal glands cause a disruption if there's too much stress in your body between the potassium sodium ratios. And you can see here, her potassium's low, her sodium potassium ratio is high. So uh, her kidneys are really struggling just to keep her body hydrated. Um, her CO2 was low, her anion gap was high. Uh, so her body uh, could not move the electrolytes and uh, did not have the energy it needs. And then her iron and ferritin levels are high too. So there's, you know, she had a storage capacity issue where her red blood cells were starving out. Even if you go down to her hemoglobin, her hemoglobin is very high as well. So a, a bit of anemic tendencies going on there. Her total cholesterol was 107. So this was a dangerous one. And uh, we'll see when we get into nutrition, uh, kind of why, but, but yeah, that's uh, too low of cholesterol. And as many of you have seen, you know, most cardiologists would pat the patient on the back and say, oh, you're doing great. You're never going to have a heart attack. But, but actually the brain is struggling because your brain is comprised of 57% fat, about 38% protein and the rest, whatever the number is five to 7% is carbohydrates. But of that 57% fat, a quarter of that is cholesterol. And your brain loves the LDL cholesterol because that's what carries nutrients to the brain. Um, her triglycerides looked fine. Her LDL cholesterol looked fine. But her HDL cholesterol was very low. And if you remember, the liver creates cholesterol first. That's the hormone that your body makes DHEA. It makes pregnenolone. It makes progesterone, testosterone, estrogens, all those beautiful hormones need cholesterol and specifically the HDL cholesterol. But the other side of the cholesterol is that makes the cortisol. And so the cortisol takes precedence. It's the alpha hormone. And so you can see in this patient that there's probably some issues with cortisol. 
Um, this patient's TSH was low. That's, uh, you know, it was, a, it's a fabricated number because she's on medication um, as is the T3 and T4, but even her total T4 is still a little low, which is why her doctor just kept ramping up the medication. But then the medication would be too high. She'd feel like her eyeballs were being pulled out of her head. She'd have anxiety. Her body would just get all tense. Um, and then her free thyroxine was low. She also, and here's the, the clincher um, with the thyroid is her thyroid peroxidase antibodies were 122. Now this is, um, you know, this is way too high. She'd had it about three times higher at one time. Um, but, you know, so it come down when she got on the medication, which is typical. Um, but her thyroid, thyroid globulin antibodies were two. And this is why she would fluctuate between hypothyroid to hyperthyroid. Um, and this is a dangerous thing uh, because her thyroid gland is literally being attacked. And when it gets attacked, you can start growing go goiters or growths. The other thing that can happen as it gets attacked is you'll actually start to see the thyroid atrophy. So that tissue will just get smaller and smaller. And we've, we do ultrasound and we can actually see the tissues in our patients shrink. Uh, her homocysteine was high, her fibrinogen was low. So homocysteine is, you know, how well do you methylate and how well do you take up your B vitamins? Um, because that is what it allows your body to make glutathione as a metabolic byproduct, or you can make homocysteine, which is an inflammatory protein. And so homocysteine being high will keep the body in an autoimmune state. Her fibrinogen was low, so she needed more vitamin C. Um, her vitamin D levels were low. And uh, so, you know, this is critical. Look at vitamin D with any of your patients who have autoimmunity. You want to keep it as close to 80 as possible. Um, DHEA was low. Uh, once again, this is because remember cholesterol is the first hormone the liver produces, and then it takes a, a dive and it goes into pregnenolone, DHEA, or cortisol. And so this might be because of what's called the cortisol steel, where the, the stress hormones are taking away from the other, the sex hormones and the growth hormone in the body. Hers was very low. Her total white blood cells was low, not surprising with an autoimmunity. And then as I mentioned before, hemoglobin was high. So her body was starving for oxygen. So this is kind of an overview of just what we look at. We're going to go through each one of these in more detail in just a minute. But remember, we're talking about pathways. So as you look at the pathways, just think how many pathways are out of balance in these patients. And then your job is to prioritize the pathways and then start knocking those down. And that's part of your overall three, four, five method. Okay. So antibodies, Isabella Wentz, uh, you know, friend of mine and just a phenomenal researcher. She's a pharmacist, functional medicine pharmacist, but um, she struggled with her own Hashimoto's and um, her consideration and her research leads her to believe that anytime you have antibodies in your thyroid above 500 uh, for your thyroid peroxidase antibodies, this is considered a very aggressive case. Anytime antibodies are under 100, that indicates a remission or a less aggressive case. And sometimes, uh, you know, as with this patient, um, you know, being on medication actually can take off some of that autoimmune attack. And this is where medication can be very helpful up front, but then you need to come back and correct the problem and then eventually get the patient off the medication because medication doesn't always make them feel better. And that's why some people just throw it away and they say it's not working anyway, but, but it can, uh, in many cases, uh, calm down the autoimmunity. Um, antibodies under 35 mean you no longer test for Hashimoto's according to conventional medical standards. But the real kicker is we want your antibodies to be under two. Um, so you can even have kind of some, some uh, baby uh, Hashis going on or just some, some little subtle autoimmunity going on early on. And this is, this is where the real art of the medicine shows up when you start to to uh, predict what the future looks like if this patient doesn't get things corrected. So, so, um, so one of the treatments that we'll use uh, right out of the gates is a peptide called thymosin alpha one. Unfortunately, the FDA has recently said, okay, this, this can no longer be compounded. We have, um, you know, basically about uh, another month supplies worth. So if you guys love thymosin alpha one, if you're using it with yourself or with your patients, 
um, you need to get your prescriptions in right away because uh, anything that works really well and the FDA, uh, you know, doesn't have this pharmaceutical drug stamped on it, or if they do like uh, uh, Zidatazin is what thymosin alpha one is labeled as um, that they, they come after the compounding pharmacies uh, pretty quick, no different than uh, certain herbs being pulled at one time or another. Um, I know like with Mitrogena being pulled uh, for a couple of years there and now it's back. I mean, it's just, um, you know, e even with uh, marijuana, uh, CBD, all these things, but peptides are really, um, you know, they're, they're some of the most revolutionizing medicine. They're very popular right now um, because they work so well without any uh, adverse reactions. Um, but thymosin alpha one is one of those that you, if you're going to get it, get it now, which is why I put this early in our slides so that, I can just give you guys a, a, a kind warning because you've heard me talk about this for a couple of years now. But, but what thymosin alpha one does is it was discovered by Dr. Uh, George uh, Goldstein um, out of the Albert Einstein School of Medicine in the '60s, and he he just looked at the expressions from the thymus gland, and he and he said, "Wow, there's a peptide that gets released called," and he named it thymosin alpha one. And he said, "What this peptide does is it stimulates." T cell production. So anytime I'm traveling, I'm using this, um, you know, with COVID scare where we have it injecting all our, our team members, our patients, um, and we, uh, everyone fared really well through it all. Um, thymosin alpha one assists the development of B cells to plasma cells. It increases mitogen response by lymphocytes. So you get um, new lymphocytes. Um, it decreases the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So the cytokine storm that or the post viral syndrome, um, thymosin alpha one is one of your best treatments. It increases chemotactic response and phagocytosis. So if you want to eat up those critters that, uh, no longer are useful in the body, um, thymosin alpha one is your go-to. It normalizes the immune balance. So, um, this is the TH2 to TH1 shift. So when patients are in that autoimmune, they have this, this shift in TH1 to TH2, this helps balance it out. Um, so thymosin alpha one is a go-to. And then, like I mentioned before, as you prioritize with your patients, so the patient you saw here, we say, okay, what's the number one priority? Well, there's antibodies present. So we've got to focus on the thyroid and, and not just the thyroid peroxidase antibodies, but the thyroid globulin antibodies. So, so that becomes our number one focus. She's got gallbladder issues. So if you look at the way her digestive system's functioning, there's going to be gallbladder issues or acid-based indexes off. That's the anion gap. That's where you saw the sodium potassium ratios. Um, and that goes into the electrolytes and the adrenal and kidney function as well. Her liver functions off. She's got GI function index that's off and then oxidative stress. So, so you go through and you prioritize and then you create a plan. So this is her nutritional index. So this is a patient who is taking a lot of vitamins, you know, handfuls every day, but you know, you realize two things. When you see this on the vitamin index, ideally this should be zero. You want all of these categories in the nutrient index. This is uh, an Evexia lab. You want all of these categories to be at a zero. And for those of you who, how many of you are using Evexia? And sorry, I see a, some questions coming in. So I'll take a pause here. Um, how many of you are using Evexia? Okay. Um, where can you purchase thymosin alpha one? So it's got to be a prescription base. We get it from Wells. Um, Gorman uses Avexia five years now. Great, Gorman. So for those of you who are not, you want to set up Avexia. If you plug in Go Wellness, then they will give you uh, basically about a hundred dollar discount on the setup fee. So hopefully that helps you out. For those of you who want to get this going, just use your, your Go Wellness as your code. Um, and Avexia does you use lab core, you just run it through lab core, but then to get this functional blood chemistry, um, workup, it's about 36 pages. Um, then you, uh, you, you run it through, uh, Avexia and it's, it's great. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Kylia, um, I, I apologize if I mispronounced your name, Kyla, um, asked, uh, can you repeat what you just said about cholesterol and cortisol? So, so cholesterol is the first hormone that your liver makes. And then all the other subset hormones get pulled off of cholesterol, like cortisol. I think that's what you're asking. And then cortisol can sometimes, because it's the alpha hormone, it will steal the DHEA and pregnenolone, um, which are your precursors for estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. <clears throat> okay. 
All right. So, okay, great. Avexia is with an E, E V E X I A. Beautiful. Okay. So as you go through this, you know, think about the things, what are the root causes of Hashimoto's and you've got to address those. So the family history of autoimmunity, leaky gut, vitamin deficiencies, adrenal gland dysfunction, sex hormone dysfunction, blood sugar imbalance. All these are uh, considerations that you'll need to, to, to consider. Um, uh, considerations you need to consider. Well, okay. They're considerations. So um, your nutrient index. So first of all, if a person has a hundred percent need for support in nutrition, then either they're not getting the right foods, not eating enough, not taking enough supplements or need supplementation, or their digestive system's not working or both. This patient was eating 800 calories a day, wanted to lose weight, um, absolutely rough. And then uh, when we ran her stool profile, she had some significant issues there. Fat index, her cholesterol, I remember her cholesterol was 107. She was not eating any fats. I mean, she was trying to lose weight. She was on the, the idea that fat makes you fat. Um, so that was problematic. So her fat index, 88%. She was, she needed, she was only getting 12% of what her body needed from fats, 0% of what her body needed from vitamins. She was only 40% hydrated. She still needed more carbohydrates. Remember, she needed more of all foods. She was basically eating, you know, some proteins and, and vegetables, which are great, but she wasn't absorbing the vegetables. Most of them were raw. So you want to see that in the vitamin index too, when it's, when it's, you know, close to a hundred or anytime you see the vitamin index showing up, get them cooking their vegetables. So yes, it's Chinese medical principle that flows in very nicely with functional medicine. Her mineral index was, you know, she's met about 71% of her needs. And then she only met about, she met about 81% of her protein index. So she still needed more protein, even though that was the main food she was eating, but it just wasn't enough. So that's one of the beauties. You know, when you look at the pathways that you want to open for thyroid, you know, this is, this is your starting place, functional blood chemistry. The next thing you want to do is order a stool profile. And I've done, um, you know, Lotus presentations on the gut, on stool at our Go Wellness events. Um, you know, I'd love to have you guys uh, join me in one of those. We do talk a lot about gut health. We go deep into there, uh, but, but we use uh, Genova. And so what you can see in Genova, we found in her case, you know, we just look at an overview and she had maldigestion, you know, as a five, one of the reasons why the the vitamins were, were not being absorbed. Inflammation was an eight. Um, you know, once again, lots of food sensitivities and that's where her homocysteine was high. And this is autoimmunity, right? You're going to have inflammation in the gut. Dysbiosis was eight. So she just did not have a great, healthy, abundant source of different bacterial species. And then she had a 10 out of 10 on metabolic imbalance. So high need for su support. Her beta glucuronidase uh, was non-functional, no short chain fatty acids, not, no butyric acid. And, and luckily we didn't find any major infections, which is rare for Hashimoto's. Most of them you're gonna see massive infection and that's what's driving it. But in her case, it, it, this was going on for about you know, 20 years. So um, look at that as one of the pathways. And then you gotta start looking at all of the factors from a nutritional perspective. You know, do you have enough iron? Is there enough iodine, uh, tyrosine, zinc, selenium, the vitamin E, B2, and B3, B6, vitamin C and D? And then you also want to look at the factors that can increase the conversion of T3 or T4 to reverse T3. So this reverse T3, that can be damaging because if you have uh, you know, uh, an issue with reverse T3, that can drive up the appetite and decrease the metabolism. And some of the factors can be stress, which is huge, trauma, low carbohydrate diet. So you do need uh, carbohydrates to activate your thyroid hormone. My patients are always shocked when I'm like, yeah, you need to eat, you need to eat carbohydrates, especially at night before bed, not right before bed, but you know, with your dinner, because those carbohydrates help activate the conversion of T4 and T3. And a lot of the thyroid patients are like, they've been trying so hard to lose weight. They're on these keto diets or, you know, paleo, low carb, and um, it actually can make it worse. Um, so 
So make sure that you're eating carbs if you have thyroid issues. Um, you can get more inflammation, toxins and infections can, in, can get in the way of the conversion. Um, you know, liver and kidney dysfunction, which she had both of those, and then certain medications, especially birth control. So your patients who are on birth control, you know, these are things you really got to uncover. So the second secret when you're working on the, the thyroid is make sure you get the correct nutrition. And then, you know, once again, this, this goes get, getting rid of the trauma, radiation, looking at flowers, um, you know, the gluten, some of those, those uh, mimicries, the molecular mimicries, which is uh, like your, your gluten, your casein in dairy, sugar can, can cause that, corn, soy. These are some of the biggest molecular mimickers that, that where your immune system can't tell the difference between that, those proteins and a pathogen. And then some of the toxins, you know, pesticide, lead, mercury, cadmium, and then autoimmune disease like celiac that can really, uh, you'll see it in the studies show that in cases of autoimmunity, your chances of having additional autoimmune uh, factors triple. So if you have one, you want to be looking for others. And so some of the factors that increase the conversion of T4 to T3. So if you see that your thyroid patients have liver issues, then you want to make sure, okay, I want to make sure I'm supporting the zinc and selenium. One of the quick tests you can do for zinc is look at your fingernails right now. And do you have any white spots? And if you have white spots, you need to add more zinc uh, to your diet or you're eating too much sugar because sugar depletes zinc. So look at your fingernails. How do they look? How many of you have beautiful fingernails? Uh, so um, yeah, that, that can be a big thing. Okay, so um, let me answer a couple of these questions. Um, okay, thanks for the great presentation. Thank you, anonymous attendee. Um, are we going to cover Graves disease? Um, we'll cover it some. What's your opinion on taking Lugol's iodine? So, so let's jump in. We're not getting uh, right into the clinical uh, tactics yet, but I'll just tell you on the iodine, if somebody has an autoimmune disease, the iodine can cause a thyroid storm. So you can actually exacerbate the thyroid condition. I love Lugol's iodine as long as the antibodies are below 35. Um, when they get up above 35, you got to work on the gut. You got to fix the nutrition. You got to fix the other hormones before I would start adding in iodine. So I hope that helps. And the Lugol's is the, the uh, potassium uh, iodine. Um, it, it's got the great ratios in it. So I, I love that. And then Adrian asks, what is the three, four, five method in a nutshell? So the, and we'll jump in, in a very great detail, but the three is, uh, number one, get the right testing. You know, and that includes opening up and correcting all the pathways, which we're talking about here. Number two is you got to have the right treatments. And then number three is you want to have the right teaching curriculum. So that's the three. The four is you remove the four stressors and we call it the epic, the epic process. So you remove the emotions. So remember E and epic, and then you remove the physical stressors. You remove the infections and the immune stressors, and then you remove the chemicals for the C and epic. So, so there you go, Adrian, that's the, that's it in a nutshell. And we'll go into deeper, deeper dive. Um, the other thing that you need to increase the sensitivity of thyroid hormone, not only vitamin A and zinc, but exercise is great. So, so make sure you're getting all of the zinc, selenium, iodine, copper, vitamins A, D, E, the B vitamins, make sure they're methylated because most of your Hashimoto's patients are going to have issues with methylation which means that they probably have some kind of variant in their MTHFR. I saw a study, uh, uh, you know, it was, uh, um, who was it? It was uh, Dirty Jeans, the Dirty Jeans doctor. I've, I've met him. He's a great guy. But anyway, um, about 50%, maybe 60% of Americans have this uh, MTHFR variant and MTRR and comb T. And so you do want to be using these methylated B vitamins. You want to increase vitamin C, turmeric, DHEA, and tyrosine for your thyroid patients. You want to be careful with the goitrogenic um, producing foods. You know, your, your patients with thyroid issues, um, they're going to want to stay away from eating large amounts of these uh, cruciferous vegetables like you know, broccoli, cabbage, kale, soy, and Brussels sprouts. They can do that if they cook them, 
because these goitrogens can impair the thyroid peroxidase enzyme. And then once it's impaired, then that allows your immune system to attack it, or you can start to develop goiters. Um, gluten, uh, once again, this is a molecular mimicker. And so gluten can um, result in an aller allergic reaction. It can also uh, result in more chronic inflammation. You, you want to get them away from the conventional dairy. Um, dairy has that, that casein in it. Um, so maybe have uh, your patients. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of dairy. I mean, uh, truth be told, I grew up on a cattle farm. So what, what can you expect? Um, but make sure you get, you know, raw goat's milk is amazing. Or even the organic A2 cow's milk, um, or it's, you know, grass fed, you know, the cows have plenty of room to roam. That could be really good milk. And if it's raw, um, that's, that's awesome. Uh, in Utah, you basically have to sign a waiver. Like, I'm sorry that I'm consuming raw cow milk. I'm, I'm, I'm that um, delinquent as a citizen that I'm actually doing this. So you basically, yeah, you, you sign away, uh, but it's much better for you. Um, make sure the, the ideal in any kind of dairy is, is way better if it's fermented. So this is um, those, you know, yogurts, um, cottage cheese, um, some, some of the fermentation can be a little better, um, and less disruptive, but if someone's in an incredible, like a, anyone over 500, um, no dairy, no gluten, like no sugar, like their diet has to be dialed in. And I even, I haven't put the parameter closer to about 250. You want to get them below that. And then they can start adding in some of these foods, but then you just watch if they, if it causes a thyroid storm, but usually it won't. Um, if you fix the gut, um, watch out for any, you know, refined carbohydrates. Um, you know, those, you know, that goes without saying anything with a, any, any chemicals in it, um, garbage leave out. Um, so here's an interesting study. The other thing on the nutritional pathways in your thyroid patients is looking out for fluorinated water. Now, this is a study that was released in 2018. And what they found is, is they, they took the, these patients and they found that just by consuming fluorinated water for one week, they found that it impacted the T3, T4, and TSH. So TSH went up, it was higher, and then their T4 and T3 was lessened because the thyroid hormone is made from iodine. And iodine is one of the halogen molecules and fluoride competes with it. And so if you have too much fluoride and, and most states, or virtually every municipal water supply in America has fluoride put into it. And I won't get into how that happened, all the history on it, but it's very interesting if you get a chance, Google it. But um, what we'll find is your patients, you want to make sure that they're not drinking fluorinated water because that fluoride will compete with the iodine and kick the iodine out. And the iodine can never be there to form the thyroid hormone. So your thyroid just gets fatigued. It's trying to make thyroid hormone, but the fluoride's there. And then if, you're, if your patients are on birth control, they're drinking fluorinated water, they're consuming gluten, they have chemical or mold exposures all the time, they're chronically stressed, it's just a recipe for autoimmunity. And that, that covers about 70% of the population. So um, make sure you get them on purified water systems. That'd be great. The other things that you want to make sure that your thyroid patients are eating is wild caught fish. Um, you know, the omega-3s, the EPA and DHA is essential for thyroid hormones. Coconut oil, these median chain fatty acids and caprylic acid. Not only will the caprylic acid and lauric acid help get rid of any fungal overgrowth or yeast overgrowth, because a lot of my thyroid patients have sugar cravings, but it also helps increase energy and fight fatigue. Seaweed. Seaweed has some natural iodine. Remember, if they're in a thyroid storm, if their antibodies are, are up uh, above 35, then you want to be careful with seaweed. But, you know, if they're, if they're doing great um, and they just they don't have the autoimmune component, get them on some seaweed or the Lugol's uh, iodine. And then some of the probiotic-rich foods, kefir. Um, you know, great fermentation, um, organic goat's milk, yogurt, uh, kimchi, kombucha, be careful, the sugar, there's now sugar-free kombucha, so that can be really good. Natto, which is the fermented soy, 
Um, natto is so interesting because it looks like boogers and it's super pungent, but natto is really good and it will blast open any clogged arteries. Um, sauerkraut and other fermented vegetables. And then some of the sprouted seeds can be great. Um, flax, hemp, chia seeds, you know, you get the ALA and the, the fatty acids are great for the thyroid. So, so then you can also use the bone broth. A lot of your thyroid patients are going to have leaky gut. And so get them on some bone broth, beef, chicken. Uh, they contain proline and L-glycine, which can help repair the digestive lining and, and improve hypothyroid. You can even measure their zonulin levels and you'll see zonulin come down by using those. And then, uh, you know, some of the great foods for zinc, beef, lamb, we love those in Chinese medicine, pumpkin seeds, lentils, garbanzo beans, uh, quinoa. I, I, uh, you know, if, if you like that, uh, turkey, selenium, you're going to get it from Brazil nuts, tuna, sardines, salmon, turkey, cod, chicken, lamb, beef, and then iodine, you'll get it from cod, shrimp, boiled eggs, or eggs, uh, navy beans, baked potatoes with skin, turkey breast, and seaweed. And make sure on your potatoes, you guys know about the resistant starch, heat your potatoes up, cook them all the way, and then let them cool down. And then that changes the nature of the starch. So then that, that becomes resistant starch and that allows for your bacteria to really feast on the starches that they love. So, so little, little hack there. Some of the iron, you know, you you want to make sure that your thyroid patients are getting plenty of iron in to build their blood. You'll notice as you start uh, treating more thyroid patients, a lot of them have issues with their, their blood. And so this is where beef, uh, chicken liver, you can do beef liver too, oysters, clams, tuna, mussels, raisins, prune juice, prunes, potato with skin, quinoa, spinach, Swiss chard, white beans, lentils, tofu, hazelnuts, and cashews. Go easy on the nuts because they're hard to digest, especially for your thyroid patients who, remember the thyroid hormone is what causes the peristalsis. And so um, you need to you make sure they're cooking all their food and they'll do so much better. You can get copper from the mushrooms like shiitake. You can get it from nuts like cashews, seeds. Sunflower seeds are some of my favorite. Um, the sunflower seed butter is really good. Uh, you can get it from garbanzo beans, lentils, lima beans, raquel, oysters, avocado. And then your vitamin A, uh, the beta carotene, beef liver, cod liver, eggs, butter, sweet potato, pumpkin, carrots, cantaloupe, mango, spinach, broccoli, kale, collard greens, butternut squash, and then vitamin C. Um, this, uh, yes, if it's uncooked, you're going to have more of it. If they have digestive issues, maybe cooking the bell peppers, they'll, they'll do better off. But bell peppers are your number one food for vitamin C, papayas, especially if you're in Hawaii, um, citrus fruits, Brussels sprouts, strawberries, and kiwis. So, and then for your vitamin E, uh, you want to consume uh, sunflower seeds, spinach, Swiss chard, avocados, turnip greens, asparagus, mustard greens. Are you guys getting hungry yet? Um, these are some pretty incredible foods. Uh, for your vitamin B2, yogurt, uh, cheeses, asparagus, spinach, dark leafy green vegetables, chicken, fish, and eggs. And then for the vitamin B3, chicken, turkey, salmon, canned tuna in water, legumes, peanuts, whole wheat, do not eat those. Um, B6 is poultry, seafood, bananas, leafy green vegetables, turnip greens, Swiss chard, and potatoes. And then B12 is uh, going to be shellfish, sardine, sardines, salmon, tuna, cod, lamb, beef, liver, chicken, fish, eggs, rainbow trout, and haddock. And then get some turmeric in. You guys can cook with it. You can do some cauliflower turmeric. Um, you put it in the air fryer. Oh, it's amazing. Um, turmeric uh, is, is, you know, you can put it in your curries and make, uh, put it in almost any food. Um, DHEA, you can boost that by having anti an anti-inflammatory diet, getting healthy fats and proteins. And then tyrosine is um, going to be, it, it, it's made in your body from phenylalanine, and it is found in chicken, turkey, fish, beef, lamb, pork, eggs, cheese, peanuts, almonds, pumpkin seeds, lima beans, avocados, and bananas. 
So it's time for a break. Um, we're going to take a break and we'll come back in uh, 15 minutes at one o'clock. Or excuse me, I guess that will be, um, um, what time is it there? That would be 12 o'clock in Pacific time. So um, really appreciate you guys. Um, thanks so much for being part of this. And I will see you guys in just a few minutes. <laughs> 